Welcome everyone to our first online class together in education philosophy. This course is especially designed for people just like you who have decided to take up the profession of teaching as your chosen career. And what a wonderful career you've chosen. As you may already have intimated in the process of making this vocational decision, teaching is quite unlike any other profession. That is to say, although it is a job, and a very busy and demanding job at that, and although you will enter many of the same, uh, I guess you'll encounter many of the same challenges and hardships, the same routines, and perhaps even many of the same joys as you found in other jobs, teaching is not simply a job. As you grow into it, and as your teaching deepens, you'll find most remarkably that teaching for you has become a way of life. What do I mean by a way of life? Well, first off, we teach certainly for the purpose of helping our students to learn. That is what we've been hired to do, eh? It's our job. And then, of course, as our job, we also do it for pay. It's our work. And as work, it is always something done for the sake of something else. Work, in as much as it is work, is always a means to an end. Play, on the other hand, is something that is done for its own sake and out of sheer delight in the activity itself. Play's purpose is intrinsic and, strictly speaking, it's useless. Work's purpose, as work, is always extrinsic. Strictly speaking, work is defined by its utility for the accomplishment of something beyond itself. Teaching seems to be both a kind of work and a kind of play. As work, as a job, it has as its goal the education of students on the one hand, and paying the bills on the other. But, in as much as we're able, in our work, to delight in what we're doing for its own sake, to that same extent, we're not simply working, but playing as teachers. One of my very favorite teachers, from whom I've learned very much, Professor James Shaw, has pointed out, often in his own books, that the best things in life are really quite useless. For instance, when you're enjoying a musical event, a good book, or a movie, when you're sending, uh, or rather when you're spending precious time with your friends and family, when you fall in love, when you appreciate beauty, when you worship, all these things are useless. That is, you don't do them for the sake of something else. Such things don't deserve any other purpose outside of them, or they don't serve any other purpose outside of themselves. They're just for themselves, as acts of loving and adoration, or perhaps as experiences of being loved or being adored. <clears throat> Teaching, when it's best, is like that. Sure, the kids are still getting edumacated and you're still getting paid. But there is, beyond these base necessities and expectations, a wonderfully deep, elusive, adorable, and precious uselessness about teaching. And about being a student, too, when school is really good. But it is there, in the experience of that uselessness, uh, that genuine love resides. Now, in education programs, we're all supposed to pay homage uh, to John Dewey. And Dewey is right about a lot of things, I think. But realize that our man Dewey wouldn't like what I've just said. For him, everything that matters in education has to be useful. You learn by doing, by manipulating, mastering, by testing the waters. You learn by making something happen. Not through the experience of uselessness. <clears throat> Indeed, experience, in his books, has no value unless it's put to use in thinking or reflecting, see? Dewey is what's called a pragmatist, after all. But we don't have to agree with Dewey if we don't want to. 
like the Nazareth uh, song. Love hurts. Well, the truth hurts too, man. And truth, uh, or true things remain true even when we turn our backs to them. Just as do these experiences of love and beauty matter deeply to us. For they're perhaps our most precious connection to truth, after all. So even apart from whether or not our students are getting their learn on, independent of whether or not they are improving, earning straight A's, kicking ass and taking names. If we're delight in our days as teachers, and in our interactions with our students and with one another, and also ever again falling in love with our own discipline or disciplines, always ourselves able to remain hungry for understanding, well, we're not just working, but we are most especially being playful in our spirit. And being possessed by such a spirit that is unconcerned with grades and improvement and outcomes and all the demands of the job, but only wanting in our hearts, or in our heart of hearts, to follow and to deepen our love for truth, as well as to entice others, our students, towards this pursuit of truth. <laughs> this goes far beyond what most people in other jobs set out to do in their professions. Teaching is kind is a kind of spiritual activity. It's like a beautiful quest that we've undertaken, but one that cannot be embarked upon without helpers, without the presence and participation of other fellow and would-be questers, that is, without our students. Teaching, in its pristine glory, is the communal pursuit of the truth for its own sake. The teacher's profession has long been recognized as a very special vocation indeed. It is a way of life. In fact, it is really two ways of life combined. <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas writes about how, at its heart, teaching is grounded in the contemplative life. What he means is that, as teachers, and in order to teach, we must have ourselves... Uh, we must have ourselves glimpsed something of what is in order to teach others about that thing. But we also aren't just people who have known and seen things. There's lots we don't know, too. As models to our students, we too must remain alive to the desire which seeks to know the truth about what is. We must yearn for and glory in coming to know about what is. As teachers, we're hot to know all about it. Hence, the contemplative life is nothing more than the life of seeing, or desiring to see what is, and not as though we were a bunch of gawkers or rubberneckers either. The contemplative desire to see, and thereby to know, isn't the same thing as idle curiosity. It does not arise where we simply seek out the titillation of seeing for the thrill of it. Indeed, much of what passes for engagement in education is precisely this sort of titillation, where we endeavor, for instance, to keep students constantly moving, constantly occupied, and constantly involved in new experiences. I don't at all mean that. Nope. The contemplative life is not something that one lives when one simply moves from sight to sight or from experience to experience for the thrill, the stimulation, or the engagement provided by such activities. Rather, the contemplative life is lived only when our knowing gaze is a loving one, where we do not simply look in order to be stimulated or engaged, but when we look and are able to appreciate whatever it is that we see. Here, appreciation has to do with gratitude, with thankfulness, with yea-saying to the nature of what exists and to our own existence. This is the deep and precious contemplative core of teaching, being able to see what is true and in knowing it, to love what is. But how tall an order is that as a teacher, eh? As a human being. How much of what is 
seems to us completely unlovable, unjust, full of pain. How much of what is strikes us as ugly? And sure, there is much that we encounter and that we see from day to day and from moment to moment. But how much of what we see do we really appreciate? How much of our time with our loved ones do we spend in deep acknowledgement of their existence? Of our own? Of this meeting with them as a gift? <clears throat> How much of our time with our students do we truly see them? How much of their own time in cl our classes do they really see and appreciate? The contemplative life is foundational in teaching. And whenever a student is truly engaged in true study or studium, but how hard is it to foster contemplative awareness in our own classrooms and in our own practices? In order to do so, teaching must become for us a way of life. It cannot simply be a profession or a 9 to 5 gig. And yet, as if that wasn't hard enough, teaching is obviously not only part of the contemplative life. Thomas Aquinas also points out that teaching is deeply part of the active life as well. By this, he means that teachers aren't just in it for themselves. Sure, they desire truth. They seek to know and to see what is, certainly. But, they want to help others to do so as well. Say you're a science teacher and you love science. You've learned so much from your own scientific investigations. You know that science is so excellent and that it can unlock wonderful sights and understandings for your students. Well, as a teacher you want to share that love with, of science with your students, don't you? It's just as though you have a wonderful gift to give your students. You hold it out in your open hands to them bearing this gift. Look what I have in my hand. See how marvelous it is. This is science. Let me show you how beautiful and excellent science can be. Let me show you how it can enrich your own life. Our word science comes from the Latin scientia, which means knowledge. And knowledge is always knowledge of something, right? Well, what we call science is a specific manner of knowing what is. In science, we uncover or discover truths about various aspects of the world through the scientific method. At its heart, then, because it's a seeking to know or to see what is, science is contemplative. The desire to know as a scientist as opposed to just being some student or some tired teacher who is forced by the curriculum to do an experiment or calculate mass or volume, and who lacks the spirit of inquiry that gives rise to scientific passion, as a scientist, a certain spirit of inquiry into being overtakes one, doesn't it? This is the contemplative component of teaching, but as a science teacher, we take our delights in seeing one step further. We seek to share this delight and to ignite it in others, in our students. In Thomas's words, we might say that what we are doing is loving or serving our neighbor when we engage in the active life of the teacher. Loving one's neighbor and loving God as the source of all truth are, in Thomas's view, the two sides of the same coin. This is the wonderful spiritual calling of the teacher in a nutshell. I don't know how many of you have had much exposure to philosophical, metaphysical, or religious thought. Perhaps some of you have heard of Thomas Aquinas before. Perhaps others among you might be familiar with the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama and his Eightfold Path in particular. Often when I was a high school teacher, I used to think about my own teaching in relation to the rest of my life and to the extent to which the way that I was living, or am living, is so fraught and imperfect and full of difficulty and confusion and lack of appreciation, inattentiveness. Perhaps some of you have thought about such things in your own lives as well. 
Anyway, I have for a long time now found the Buddhist Eightfold Path intriguing. Its enumerated elements all combine as necessary components, each affecting all the others as a means to live a life that is fully awakened to the reality of what is. Essentially, the contemplative goal of teaching, as Thomas points out. Briefly, these eight, <coughs> these eight elements of the Eightfold Path are right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But can you see just how hard it is as a teacher always to teach from the aspect of right understanding? Certainly we might find it easy as adults to teach long division to elementary kids. We know how to do long division ourselves. But what about right understanding uh, or rightly understanding our students themselves? What about right understanding of ourselves? What about right understanding of the world? Or of our moment-to-moment -moment apprehension of the world around us? Same goes for right thought. It's easy to have a right thought when 2 plus 2 equals 4. But what about when it comes to messy things like when Sam is bullying Emma? Or when the department head is bullying us? Or when new models of assessment are being introduced or foisted upon teachers in a school, for instance? And then again, right speech. It's easy for us to watch our P's and Q's with the kids. We wander into a classroom and we're on our guard as teachers to model good speech. But don't we very often find ourselves to have accidentally said the wrong thing? Or the right thing, but in the wrong way? And <clears throat> aren't there times when it's better to say nothing at all? When do you speak up? What do you say? When do you say it? And when do you say nothing? What about when we're frustrated by aggression expressed towards us by a parent, or our principal, or a contentious colleague? <laughs> what about when dealing with someone else who is meddlesome? What about when we are experiencing frustration? What about when we feel justified in blurting out just how ridiculous someone was being, or how unfair is some situation, or how frustrated we are? What about on the car ride home from work, as we're running through all the things that have happened during the day in our minds. What about in our inward speech to ourselves, or our self-talk? What about the manner of our discussions with the wife, or the husband, or the friend? And if we talk in an ugly or unmindful way, how does this affect our understanding, or our thought? And how might talking or thinking such things down the road affect our ability to engage in right action? Or again, we put, it, uh, we put in such efforts all day long as teachers to be the very best at what we're doing. We work so hard. But what about our right efforts at mindfulness? What about our efforts to constantly be understanding of the state of things? and of our students from moment to moment, from day to day. And don't even get me started on right concentration. Do you see how hard it is? And how challenging it is to be a teacher who endeavors to walk the Eightfold Path? When teaching isn't just a gig that pays the bills, but rather is a way of life? When teaching is a way of being? This is your own wonderful calling. Mind you, Given how frustrating and challenging all this is, and therefore how teaching calls upon us to practice and to be patient with ourselves and with our own students in the, ma in the messiness of these things, there is a silver lining, ladies and gentlemen. Right livelihood! From a Buddhist point of view, there are many jobs that embroil people in real moral and ethical conundrums. I used to work in a bank. Let me tell you that about nine months of banking was all I could take before my skin was crawling too badly for me to stay. Either I'd have to quit, which I did, or 
it would have meant sacrificing some deep moral imperatives on my part. Thinking about other jobs you yourself have had in the past might similarly <clears throat> lead you to wonder about their effect on your own state of mind as well. Buddhists might say, for instance, that being a butcher would involve you in killing, or being successful in business might at various times involve you in greediness and lack of compassion or compassionate regard for your competitors. Or how being an oil executive might involve you perhaps in the destruction of the environment. The list of vocational conundrums goes on. But as teachers, thank goodness we have a noble profession. In as much as we're truly teachers, that is, in as much as we take up teachings as an embodiment of both the active and contemplative lives, loving our neighbor while loving the truth, we can rest assured that this vocation we've chosen will be a great boon to us in our own lives and in the lives of others while we struggle to hit the mark in each of the other seven components of the Eightfold Path. Whew! This has been a long introduction to the subject of today's lecture, which is journaling, self-knowledge, and education. Nonetheless, I wanted to speak about the nature of teaching with you because... As you can see, when teaching becomes for you more than a job, but also a way of life that is both active and contemplative, it calls you to know yourself. Teaching calls you to know your students. It calls you to know what is. This self-knowledge component is the real heart of education. And if self-knowledge is such an imperative for us as teachers when teaching is a way of life for us, then what about our students? When we engage in the active component of the life of the teacher, aren't we, after all, trying to light a fire in our students so that they too seek to know what is and who they are themselves? Much of the time, of course, school seems not to be about that at all. Very often, it seems that what goes on in classrooms is more like a series of tasks we put students through to see how well they measure up to the outcomes or objectives specified in our respective programs of studies. Education seems mostly to be about ranking and bean counting and helping students to rank higher than they otherwise might without our assistance. Self-knowledge really doesn't appear to have much to do with school in this regard. But it doesn't have to be that way. What I'd like to do with you during our class together is have you encounter a number of great theorists and influential writers. I want you to listen to them deeply. See what they have to say. How does what they say resonate with you? What vision of the world and of learning and education do these authors commend to you? Does it seem to you that this or that author tells the truth? The whole truth? And nothing but the truth? Or is there something fishy going on? How does what each author says jibe with your own experience of things and of learning. Does the author miss out or close down on the investigation of certain aspects of existence that you know and have seen or felt to be the case? Or on the contrary, does that author open your eyes to new vistas and new experiences or way of thinking about the world that enrich your being? and that leave you thankful for the insights. In short, I want you to read these authors with me, not as some exercise in getting her done, but rather as an exercise in coming to know yourself. And moreover, to know yourself as a teacher who is tasked not just with a 9 to 5 job, but who has taken up teaching as a way of life. This sort of writing and learning we will be doing in class, therefore, ought to be deeply personal. 
<clears throat> what you write isn't expected to be voiced in the false, objective third person. Here, you will keep a journal of your thoughts, your questions, your encounters and struggles. Here, you will venture into your own undiscovered countries of the inward nature. Here, in our class together, you are tasked with genuinely encountering the texts we shall read together. These authors will help you in your explorations. You will enter into conversation with them. You'll experiment with their thoughts on things. You'll try them out for size in your own life and see where they lead. In this class, you're tasked with exploring yourself through reading and writing journalistically, with expressing your forays into self-inquiry in a variety of ways, and with remaining diligent and persistent on a daily basis in your quest for self-knowledge. Remember, you're writing a journal. You're allowed to spell things wrong and to stutter. You're allowed self-contradictions as you play with concepts and ideas. You're allowed to fail, to take wrong turns, to make mistakes, and to express your understandings of things, no matter how partial, in a variety of ways. The only real requirements here are sincerity of effort, openness, and persistence or diligence. That is, as you proceed through this course, in which journaling will figure as the centerpiece of your learning, you must try your best to be sincere in your efforts to know the truth, to keep an open mind towards the authors we study and towards the processes of investigation, and not to shirk the requirement for daily writing and experimentation. What we're doing in this class is laying the contemplative foundation for your future teaching practice. We're stoking that inner fire within each one of us to know what is through reading and exploring and experimenting with a variety of authors who, in their own ways and to varying degrees, have wrestled with such things. Moreover, by taking up inquiry into ourselves as teachers through journaling, we might in turn have a better sense of how to do such things in our own classrooms down the road and with our own students. For as Socrates long ago said, the unexamined life is not worth living. In our course together, it will be, it will be important for you to follow the scheduled readings and other requirements. There's no big term paper in this course, but that doesn't mean that rigorous writing and effort is not demanded. It will be important for you to write a little bit every single day, including on those days <coughs> when we do not meet and on weekends. This is why I suggest that you carry a little paper journal with you. You may use a hard or a soft cover journal. It's up to you. If you fill it up, that's okay. Go get another one. That will be volume two. When you hand them in to me, you can tie them together with a string or a rubber band. I like low-tech solutions. They're very endearing. You may write, or you may print, of course. If you find it hard to aim in a straight line, then you may wish to use a journal with lined paper inside. But it's okay if you want to use one that doesn't have lines, like an artist's sketchbook, for instance. Or, if you like, there are those inexpensive Hilroy Cahiers, or those little paper workbooks that kids use in elementary school where the bottom half of the page is lined, but the top half is blank, to include room for illustrations. You can use pen, ink, pencil, crayon, marker, paint, charcoal, whatever suits you in your various entries. You can tape in pictures, or photos, or artifacts. You can draw. You can write personal reflections, prose, poetry. 
You can write analytically or critically. <coughs> you can include artwork, musical or audio CDs, video clips or DVDs, any other item that you can cram between the pages of your journal. It's up to you. If you examine the course outline, you'll see that I've offered some fairly specific details about uh, the sorts of things that you might do in a journal. I have, for instance, included a long list of experiments, writing prompts, and different approaches that you might take in your daily writings. The list is non-exhaustive. I have also offered you some guidelines about the importance within the set of writings that you will do during our course together of ensuring that some of your, er, your experiments transpire over a series of entries. <coughs> that is, how some things you'll write about are really longer term experiments. You'll need to record how these experiments are going, what you've thus far learned from them, or thought about them. And you'll notice too how the prompts I've included all connect back to education, back to you as a teacher who stands in relation to students, making such connections back to education and teaching in your journaling will be very important as well. In addition to keeping this journal <coughs> during our time together, I'm asking you also to become involved in assessing its contents. If you look once more at the course outline, you'll see that I've included there some stock card black masters for various assessment criteria that I want you to apply to your own writing. Print out a copy of the course outline, use scissors to cut out these cards, and periodically as you write, leaf back through your entries, picking out exemplars for each item, <coughs> providing your own brief analysis or explanation of why you've chosen this or that item as an example. Staple or tape, paper clip glue, or otherwise affix these cards to the items in your journal <coughs> that you feel best correspond. Anyway, I very much hope that you find this form of writing, reading, and exploration authentic and valuable during our time together. Perhaps, if you try it and you like it, it'll whet your appetite to adopt similar writing practices with your own students as you move into your own teaching career. I look forward to reading all about your thoughts and questions, your discoveries and adventures. <coughs> now, on to the first set of readings. Perhaps many of you are unfamiliar with journaling as a form of inquiry. Especially in the older grades, journaling tends to fall off the radar for kids. Mostly due to school expectations, school culture, and concerns over the big standardized tests, teachers very often focus on teaching to the test. That is, kids only learn to write in the canned formats and according to the canned prompts handed to them by the provincial government. <coughs> Needless to say, this can make for some pretty inauthentic writing. But journals are not just something people have done in their bedrooms when they are, were very young. Journals aren't simply like keeping a diary of secrets. They can be, of course, but journals can be much more exploratory and contemplative in nature. <coughs> I've chosen to share with you only a small selection of the great journals and journalers in history. And my intent is, uh, here is to give you the flavor of what it means to journal, and so that you might see something of the rich diversity and power in journaling your own thoughts and ideas. Journaling, for the authors we are studying, is a spiritual practice. These authors are all, in various ways, teachers who live teaching as a way of life. I'm presenting them to you here in a rough gloss so that by learning about them, you yourself might be inspired to get started keeping your own journal. Maybe you'll even continue the practice long after our class is finished. 
The first journaler I have, <coughs> I have recommended for you to read is Marcus Aurelius. I have suggested you read Meditation 1, or actually Meditation 2, sorry, Meditation 2, out of his larger set of journals simply entitled Meditations. Aurelius lived in the 2nd century AD. He was a pretty big shooter in his day, a Roman emperor in fact, but he was also uh, what is known as a Stoic philosopher. Now, let me fill you in a little about Stoicism and ancient philosophy. First off, <coughs> the word philosophy comes from the Greek words philia and sophia. Philia means friendship, and sophia means wisdom. So, philosophy is literally friendship with or love of wisdom. Already you can hear how weird that sounds when you think about how people today use the word philosophy. The word is bandied about quite a bit, really. As part of your application for employment as a teacher, please include a brief one or two page statement of your philosophy of teaching. <clears throat> what is the management philosophy of this company? What's your philosophy on shopping? I have my doctorate in philosophy of marketing. None of that uh, has anything at all to do with philosophy. What people really mean when they say such things is, what's your opinion of X? And <clears throat> I have a big shooter degree that shows I've developed a high degree of mastery in a specified field of study. That's what a PhD is. But surely not philosophy. Surely not loving wisdom. In fact, <clears throat> philosophy isn't even a subject you can study in school. Sorry, philosophy departments. So, sorry, philosophy of education course teachers. See, philosophy isn't a study like physics that you pick up in a physics class. And then when you're done, you put it aside and move along to math class and next to social studies. <clears throat> and then maybe you're off the gym for some physical exercise. You don't pick up and put down philosophy like some topic of scrutiny or some method of inquiry. Philosophy isn't something you get out of a book either. It's not a theory of knowledge or a system of thought. It's not a doctrine or a dogma or a set of ideas or concepts that you learn. Nope. Philosophy is rather a spirit of inquiry. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Philosophy is a kind of love. It's a burning desire for what is highest and best that might lie kindled as precious embers within and through careful nurturing burst into flame in the midst of any subject or during any investigation if its special spirit is nurtured. Do you have people in your life that you love? Is there ever a time when it is not appropriate for you to love them? Well, it's time for math. Can't love my mom now. And to heck with my daughter. No, of course not. You should always love these people. <clears throat> In fact, if you could, I'm sure you'd like to be able to love them better and cherish them more than you do right now even. Well, Philosophy is like that too. Wisdom is what is greatest and best. It is indeed what is most lovable. Without wisdom, no other goods, whether they be health or wealth or love or success, no other goods can be themselves properly loved, properly understood, or properly enjoyed. So philosophy as a spirit it's all-consuming, ladies and gentlemen. When it overtakes you, you come to see how this spirit must remain alive within you, and perhaps also how easily it fades from your awareness through forgetfulness and lack of attention, through selfish regard or 
preoccupation with desires for goods that are misunderstood as though they were really as good or better than wisdom. <coughs> Philosophy spirit is something that a man or a woman must rekindle, reawaken, and remember from moment to moment. It's a deeply mindful practice of being alive to what is most lovable. It is, in short, a way of life. Do you see already how much the philosopher's life resembles the teacher's life? When teaching takes on its true nature as both active and contemplative? <clears throat> Indeed, some might, and many do, deride the philosopher for just sitting around thinking and not being up to much. Versus the teacher who is so active <clears throat> and so busy helping others live the life of learning. But really, philosophy is very much a communal activity. It's very much something one does with one's neighbor. It involves dialogue and discussion, and back and forth with others in the pursuit of wisdom. Philosophy <coughs> is certainly not as insular as all that. The good that the philosopher seeks isn't some private good, after all, but the greatest good of all. And a good that is good for everyone always. But seeking out this one great good that is in no way private, limited, finite, or fleeting, one who philosophizes necessarily must put aside all his or her selfish, private, and finite concerns in order to lend attention to that quest for the highest and best good, which is wisdom. This takes some practice, ladies and gentlemen. It's something we must get at from day to day, putting in our best efforts. Now, Marcus Aurelius was one such philosophizing person. That is to say, for him, philosophy wasn't just a purely intellectual or abstract or formal exercise divorced from life. Like highly complicated and arcane mental gymnastics that only a few smarty pants types could ever do. And although philosophy, as Aurelius practiced it, certainly involves reasoning in the intellect, in order to, in order to be efficacious, he knew that it must, <coughs> it must also link the work of the imagination and the life of the passions, of the whole soul, in fact, to the educational task at hand. Understand that philosophizing for Aurelius was most definitely the truest and best form of education. Again, and I cannot stress this enough to you, in its original ancient aspect, philosophy was not just some theoretical construct like it is conceived of today. Rather, <clears throat> it was a peculiar spirit that <clears throat> underpinned and informed daily practices in the pursuit of wisdom. The philosophic life therefore included a daily training regime designed to help people live better and to look at the world in a new way. Essentially, philosophy is one of the best examples you'll find anywhere of what's nowadays called transformative education. Education as Aurelius practiced it, and what we see from his journals, was self-education. It was the daily training of the self by the self, or by a well-practiced teacher, to accept what is the case, what is one's fate, or the cards that one has been dealt in life, rather than being filled with resentment, or envy, or hatred, due to the various things that might happen from day to day in the course of your own existence. The Stoics' <coughs> education is motivated largely by the desire to cultivate that spirit of acceptance and appreciation for what is. In Christian terms, to be able to say, Thy will be done, in all its circumstances that arise. The ability to find the big picture in things, to praise it with all of its blemishes and pockmarks, rather than always seeking all those goods that we cannot have or that we cannot keep. Stoic teachings are, essentially, designed to help one be free 
from the sweep of emotions and to live a rational, principled life. <coughs> now to, e <coughs> to reiterate, Marcus Aurelius, just, he didn't just have a doctrine or hold a set of ideas about the world that made him stoic. Mind you, there certainly are thoughts and convictions that Stoics hold that distinguish them from Socrates, from Plato, or from the ancient schools that were prominent at the time. But for all these ancient pursuers of wisdom, philosophy was, as it was for Aurelius, a daily practice. It was something you do from moment to moment. It was a way of life. And the selections from Aurelius's journals or meditations that you're reading are really just little daily experiments and reminders and exercises <coughs> that he used to help himself cultivate mindful attention to the importance of seeking out wisdom. In fancy Greek talk, they are called hypomnemnata. That is to say, they were notes written on a daily basis for the author's personal use. And scholars like Pierre Hadot contend that Aurelius used them precisely in this way, as a means to be able to see past all the distractions of daily existence and not to be swept, swept up by pain or suffering, by streams of consciousness, by fear, anger, or desire for things that are not wisdom. Through his journaling, Aurelius sought ways to help himself remember what is most important in life. Perhaps your own journaling efforts and those of your future students as well might share this valuable quality with the writings of Aurelius. <clears throat> so what about, <coughs> what about these daily meditations? If you read through all of Aurelius's journals, you'll discover a whole array of experiments and daily practices that you can try um, to help you get clarity of perspective from moment to moment. Things like special meditations designed to help you analyze the causes of your discontent as it rises during the day. Meditations devised to help you see clearly the ephemeral nature of daily existence, to recognize the transient nature of earthly goods so that we will not be so tempted to cling to them in a deluded way and so that we might therefore suffer less. Aurelius also proffers contemplative exercises that will help you to feel the cosmos, or good order of being, all around you, in order that you might see and remember how you too are part of that grand cosmic order. An awareness which in turn will hopefully uh, breed within you some thankfulness and appreciation for your time on this earth. There are other meditations about the connectedness or interrelatedness of all things. Still others concern the vastness of time and space in order that we might gain some, gain some needed perspective on the, finite, or the finitude and relative insignificance of our own lives and of all the molehills we turn into mountains. Other experiments <coughs> are designed to help you learn to watch the flow of things dispassionately so that you don't behave reactively towards things that occur in your life. Through such daily practices you might learn little by little not to be so easily swept up by the flow of your experiences, but simply to observe this flow without clinging or judgment. Still other meditations Aurelius includes concern the analysis of our experiences themselves exercises that invite us to separate matter from form in order to contemplate the duration of things. Over and over again, it seems that Aurelius' daily journaling practices are designed to hone our virtue, and most especially to deepen our magnanimity towards others and all things, particularly through emphasizing the importance of being able to resign oneself to the way that things are in the world, not always being resentful about such things 
or at odds with the ways and workings of the world. In order to encapsulate the spirit of Aurelius's educational efforts as an avid journaler, let me therefore quote a beautiful text by George Friedman, <coughs> written in 1942, which, as Pierre Hadot remarks, could have been written by a Stoic of antiquity. <clears throat> Here it is. <coughs> Take flight each day, at least for a moment, however brief, as long as it is intense. Every day, a spiritual exercise, alone or in the company of a man who wishes to better himself. Leave ordinary time behind. Make an effort to rid yourself of your own passions. Become eternal by surpassing yourself. This inner effort is necessary. This ambition just. Think then, as you read Aurelius, <clears throat> how you might benefit from incorporating such little moments of spiritual practice into your own life, into your own daily teaching practices and class activities. How might such activities and experiments enrich your classroom? How might such things improve your own, as well as your students' frame of mind, yours and their attitudes, and help everyone feel more appreciative at the end of the day? towards the entire educational endeavor. Consider, as you journal your investigations, the possible merits of such things for your life as a teacher. As an accompaniment <clears throat> to what you will find in Aurelius, I thought it valuable also to recommend to you some selections from A.G. Sertelange's uh, great little book entitled The Intellectual Life. <clears throat> If you take up these suggested readings, <clears throat> you'll see that, unlike Aurelius, they're not written in journal form. And so they don't really serve as examples for the sort of thing that you'll be doing in cl this class. But Sertelange's work does help us to think about how we might best arrange our lives for genuine teaching. Where teaching is not simply a job, but also a way of life, that is to say, where teaching incorporates into itself both the contemplative pursuit of truth and act of servants towards the neighbor by inviting him or her into this self-same pursuit. <clears throat> if this is your ambition, then this book is just for you. One of the struggles I have felt rather acutely as a teacher is that, on the one hand, we spend our days and very often much of our evenings and weekends, helping others to think, to learn how to think, to explore, and to write. And yet on the other hand, <clears throat> we ourselves are not allowed any space or time in which to do our own precious thinking, our own exploring, or our own writing. It's ridiculous that we have such things as professional development days and that we're required to write up TPGPs, but nowhere is the vital contemplative core of teaching as a way of life acknowledged or nurtured. Teaching, as you will live it on a day-to-day -day basis, doesn't just require your physical presence all the time. It requires your entire attention. For the period of your teaching life, you will be consumed by the activity. There will not be much room in your day for free thinking or freedom of mind. Where other occupations might grind away at your body, like grueling farming or back-breaking construction, in such jobs your mind is still left wonderfully free to play and to travel through interesting problems and grand questions during the workday. As a boy, growing up on my family's farm, I can attest to the sweetness of the leisure I found in grueling farm labor for precisely that reason. And this leisure of mine seems to be, for me at least, one of the attractions, if not saving graces, underlying many mindless jobs <clears throat> that I've enjoyed in the past. One's body 
maybe metaphorically in chains, and one hours or one's own hours may be owned by the man, and as Jim Morrison says, traded in for a handful of dimes. But one's mind remains happily free as a bird. Teaching, by contrast, can be very grinding, all-consuming business. And therein lies one of the grave dangers of the teaching profession, ladies and gentlemen. If teaching is more than just a highly demanding job, and if teaching isn't simply active, but also at its foundation deeply contemplative, then we must at all costs avoid allowing our love of truth and our personal quest for truth to atrophy. We must carve out time during our days at work and after work to cultivate the contemplative aspect of our being. Sir Delange's can help us. Sir Delange's book provides us with great bits of advice about how valuable it will be for us to rearrange the little details of our lives and our daily habits in such a way as to make room for our contemplative propensities to flourish. Although his book is not per se about teaching, <coughs> it nonetheless resonates well with the contemplative heart of the teacher's vocation. First off, Sir Delange offers us or offers his readers, rather, some careful words about how to cultivate true studiousness in our own lives, an attribute that, if we embody it well, might serve also as an excellent model for our own students. For as you know, often the very best sort of teaching in such things is by example. <clears throat> so what is the place of study in the life of the teacher? One of my favorite lines from Sir Delange's book is when he calls genuine study a prayer to truth. <clears throat> I like that very much. Study is a prayer to truth. For those of you who still remain interested in study yourselves, in reading and researching and writing, Sir Delange <clears throat> offers a delightful array of suggestions about how to fit such things into your own busy lives and schedules as teachers. After all, why should your students be the only ones having such fun and studying, eh? I know many of you think that sounds pretty bizarre at this point in your lives as students. You probably can't wait to be done and finished with your own studies, eh? You want a job! <clears throat> Enough of this tomfoolery, steel. Let me sh or show me the money! But here, I'm not talking about the drudgeries of being a student or the financial debts that you've incurred. Here, I'm talking about the genuine delight to be found for human beings in studying and in thinking. I hope at least some of you know what I mean. But even if you don't, think of it this way. Why shouldn't teachers also be students, or as our government masters like to trumpet, and as lip service is paid now in the biz, why shouldn't you yourself be a lifelong learner? <clears throat> Sir Delange takes this point, um, I guess this learning imperative, very seriously. He recommends such things as slackening <coughs> the tempo of your own life in order to make more room for the peace, the quiet, and the solitude needed for such delights of the intellect and of study to arise. He bids us peel away non-essentials and distractions. He tells us to simpler, simplify our lives in ways that minimize our involvement in excessive obligations. But his recommendations do not simply entail getting rid of unnecessaries. He also bids us to rethink how we speak with others and to carefully consider the situations in which we engage in conversation, a practice he calls retirement. Sir Delange's writes, 
be slow to speak and slow to go to those places where people speak. Because in many words, the Spirit is poured out like water. By your amiability to all, purchase the right really to frequent only a few whose society is profitable. Avoid, even with these, the excessive familiarity which drags one down and away from one's purposes. Do not run after news that occupies the mind to no purpose. Do not busy yourself with the sayings and doings of the world. That is with such as have no moral or intellectual bearing. Avoid useless comings and goings which waste hours and fill the mind with wandering thoughts. These are the conditions of that sacred thing, quiet recollection. We shall have more to say about this idea of recollection as we explore Plato's writings a bit later in the course. <coughs> but for now, take Sir uh to mean simply that the reorganizations required for good teaching, when teaching is not just a job but a way of life, involve not only rethinking the environment of our obligations and our affiliations, we must also consider the virtue of cultivating good mental hygiene through exercising care even in our speech, since what we say and the pastimes we have taken up have noteworthy effects upon our thoughts, our passions, and our inner lives. It kind of rings well with what we discussed earlier about teaching in the Eightfold Path, eh? Other tips Sir Delange offers include the importance of fresh air and exercise, <clears throat> the value of sleep, and real vacations. Advice on how to engage in contemplative activities in the valuable early morning hours and in the night. Suggestions on how to read, how to research, how to approach writing. All these things are of great value for the teacher who seeks also to be and to remain a student and a learner. Sir Delange's book is full of excellent recommendations in this regard. But most importantly, as a teacher for whom teaching is a way of life, you must endeavor to carve out a space for the work that is not work, but rather delight in contemplation. Let me end this introduction to Sir Delange's writings with another quote from his book, The Intellectual Life. You must defend your solitude with a fierceness that makes no distinction whatever. If you have duties, satisfy their demands at the normal time. If you have friends, arrange suitable meetings. If unwanted visitors come to disturb you, graciously shut the door on them. It is important during the hours sacred to work, not only that you should not be disturbed, but that you should know you will not be disturbed. Let perfect security on that score protect you, so that you can apply yourself intensively and fruitfully. You cannot take too many precautions about this. Keep a Cerberus at your door. Every demand on you from outside is a loss of inner power and may cost your mind some precious discovery. When half-gods go... The gods arrive. But note that this complete solitude, the only favorable atmosphere for work, need not be understood physically. Someone else's presence may double instead of disturbing your quietude. To have near you another working equally ardent, a friend absorbed in some kindred thought or occupation, a chosen spirit who understands your work, joins in it, seconds your efforts by silent affection and keenness fired by your own, that is not a distraction, it is a help. <clears throat> Moving on from Aurelius and Sir Delange, 
The next author I have recommended that you inspect is the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. I suggest that you read a bit of Nietzsche for a number of reasons. First, he's a very fine philosopher for whom philosophy was most definitely a way of life. And so, this makes him well relatable to the notion of teaching as a way of life. Second, very much of what Nietzsche has written takes the form of short bursts of brilliance, widely known as aphorisms. These are ideal as exemplars for your own journal writing entries. In these little bursts, <clears throat> Nietzsche is doing all kinds of experimenting. He's thinking on the page, really. <clears throat> I had an Oxford-trained professor back at, back at McMaster University who used to sneer at Nietzsche for being self-contradictory in his writing. But come on, you're allowed to be self-contradictory in your journal, aren't you? Just because what you've written, some, uh, say some treatise back at Oxford, is consistent or systematic, does that make it true? Or interesting? Maybe it just makes it consistently bad or consistently one-sided. Or as Nietzsche would say, flat-headed. No, in your journals, you're allowed to contradict yourself. To take up a variety of perspectives and points of view and to see where they all lead. And to notice what you, see, uh, what you can uh, see of a thing from that weird angle. That's the beauty of the aphoristic style, really. It's experimental, and it allows you to explore and to see more than you might otherwise. And it really invites taking chances with your writing, entering into unexplored territories. And it's playful, too. Not at all serious. And certainly, play is an important aspect of education, ladies and gentlemen. The Greek word for play is paideia. And their word for education is paideia. Pretty similar, eh? Nietzsche, although he's a German, is also pretty Greek in that regard. His journalistic writings are very playful. And hopefully yours will be too. Hopefully you enjoyed writing your daily entries. And hopefully, if ever you decide to have your own students try journaling, they too will enjoy the freedom, the adventuresome wandering, and the experimental attitudes cultivated by journal writing as a contemplative activity. So far as I'm aware, the whole notion of the thought experiment kind of comes from Nietzsche. Now guys like Aurelius had been doing it for thousands of years previous, but the name thought experiment has become, for better or worse, associated with what Nietzsche is doing in his own writing. I'd like you to run your own journals as thought experiments as well, ladies and gentlemen. I've provided an example of one of Nietzsche's most famous thought experiments for you to consider. And it's good to remember that these are just experiments. They're not doctrines or dogmas or credos or belief systems. They're not meant that way, so don't be fooled. Thought experiments are simply ways of holding things up and looking at them differently, from a different perspective, just to see what might follow. The ones I've invited you to read are from his notebooks and concern his myth of the eternal return. Or eternal recurrence is another word used. <clears throat> his purpose in these two short entries is uh, to offer us an experimental perspective from within which we might evaluate our own actions, our own choices, and ask ourselves how much of what we are and what we do can we actually affirm? And not just for now, but for always. Although each of our lives is only such a brief thing after all, what about viewing this life we have against the backdrop of eternity? How do we stand in relation to that? How do we orient ourselves towards eternity? How do we find the eternal in the now? in the onrush, of the, in the continual flush, flux of things, rising and falling. 
Nietzsche's purpose in these two short experiments is simply to create for himself, and perhaps for his readers as well, opportunities to cultivate a yes-saying attitude towards life. And not <clears throat> just to the bits we like, the rainbows and the unicorns, but being able to say yes to that shadowy side of life, with all of its pain and its woes. Nietzsche's little thought experiments are invitations to us to try out ways of seeing things whereby we might reconcile ourselves to a loving acceptance of what is and affirm our whole self in the process. Not vilifying or condemning any part of existence, but taking all of what is together and loving every part. This love of what is, Nietzsche refers to by the term amor fati, or love of fate. There are days when you're teaching where such a thought and such an experiment is certainly of great value. Those days when things aren't going well at all. When you're so overloaded with work and demands. When you feel yourself a bit of a failure. Or when you're frustrated by how unfairly sometimes you're treated as a teacher. Given how hard you work and how much of yourself you pour into your profession. How to deal with these adversities. How not to lose sight of the big picture by getting caught up in all the little details or being swept up by resentments. How not to be too hard on yourself for the bad that maybe you've spotted in yourself and in the way that you don't handle everything perfectly in your classroom. How not to fixate on the negative or to be deluded by how swimmingly well things are going. <clears throat> how to see and to accept the students you have before you. How to say yes, in other words, to this vocation you've chosen when every sinew and every bone seems to cry out, Enough! These are there are days like this, certainly. And Nietzsche can help you. Nietzsche's manner of living thoughtfully and writing contemplatively, he describes as wandering. Nietzsche suffered throughout his life from terrible health. He had awful migraines, and sitting indoors or at a desk was quite unbearable for him. <coughs> Nietzsche needed the mountains and the crisp, cool air to clear his thoughts and to crystallize his words. In his notebooks, he wrote that one ought never to trust a thought that comes when sitting down. The best thinking comes from walking, from hiking, from wandering. And Nietzsche most especially characterized his own manner of philosophizing as wandering. Indeed, wandering is a good descriptor for what you will do when you journal as you read the philosophers and thinkers included in this course. Understanding that a wanderer is different than a pilgrim. A pilgrim is uh, someone who has a mission, right? He's got an aim and a sure destination point. He's going from point A to point B. That's his goal. The ancient Greek word for this final end or goal is telos, by the way. We get our word teleology from that. And the pilgrim makes a beeline for this telos. He doesn't jig off this way and then jag off that way, or at least not on purpose. Nope. He's driven by the sight of his good and final perfect end. The wanderer, however, doesn't have any such final goal or telos in sight. And lots of times life's like that, isn't it? We don't see what is this good or final end in things. The world's crazy and confusing place. Sometimes folks try to tell us what our goal or end should be. Sometimes we're raised to believe that this or that end is the real end or goal to everything. But very often we're not really sure if it is right for us 
or if it really speaks to us in the situation we find ourselves at that moment. Maybe other ends seem more authentic to our situation. Maybe we see something else worth pursuing. And so we pursue that instead, only to have our ends change as we experience more and see more, and as we grow in our understanding. There's a great painting that I often used to show my high school kids in English class. It's by the German artist uh, David Kaspar Friedrich, and it's entitled Wanderer Above Sea and Fog. You can Google it. Kids like this painting, as I do. And really, it wonderfully represents Nietzsche's notion of philosophic <coughs> inquiry and exploration as wandering. Look it up. See how the wanderer in the picture stands high above a great mist-filled valley on a mountaintop, triumphant and exalted, perhaps at the pinnacle of his explorations? See how he stands there and gazes down, seeing what is below him in a grand view? There is something not just heroic, but also godlike about this man, too. We only see the back of his head, after all. And yet, something simultaneously human, all too human, about his grand vision. For even in his widest view of things, it's, it's impeded and impartial. At most, the wanderer has struggled to the top of this particular spire to find a little bit of clarity and to gain valuable perspective. And this perspective, in turn, bears some relation to other perspectives on mountain tops, which he might have climbed earlier, or ones which he might indeed climb later. But he cannot ex he cannot see exactly their relation. And whereas he's climbed above the mist to see the tallest peaks of things, he cannot, from that vantage point, See what lies below the mists. These details and these lows are concealed from him. Moreover, he cannot stay up on that peak forever, eh? He must descend into the mists and the darkness once again, where things are not so clear. In fact, that's part of his courageousness. And he has no specific end point in any of his journeying. He's climbing, and he's wandering, and he's exploring in order to see more and to know more along the way, exerting himself and testing his own limits, but also knowing that any vision he has of things is at best a partial one. How much of our own education and learning is like this? How much of our own adventuring spirit for learning and inquiry is like the wanderer spirit, as articulated by Nietzsche. How might you render your own classroom so that it's a place of such adventures and such wandering for your students? Alongside of this painting, I'd have you also peruse the short selections from Nietzsche's 1878 to 1880 work entitled Human All Too Human. Here Nietzsche tells you a bit about what he means by wandering. In particular, he offers you a delightful little dialogue that the wanderer uh, has with himself as he goes about his travels. Here he chats with his shadow, that dark aspect of each one of us, and that part that perhaps, to various degrees, each one of us is uneasy about or unhappy to acknowledge. But the wanderer as one who seeks to cultivate a broad knowledge and understanding of the world and of himself, does not want to condemn this part of himself. He recognizes it as his close friend, in the same fashion as ancient authors used to call the true friend a second self. Nothing is more precious to Nietzsche in all of his writings and friendship. So the wanderer, in cultivating his friendship with his dark self, 
seeks to understand and ultimately to affirm all of what is and all that he himself is. He wants to be able to love life and to accept all that happens, good and bad. This is his great challenge. And perhaps as you embark upon your own teaching career, finding yourself now in the mists and now upon the spires, it will be your challenge as well. Not just befriending, befriending yourself, but also teaching your students to love and to befriend their own selves and their own shadows.